Um, Mal, you are um, a huge role model to, to me and my wife. Uh, I think for, for many years now, you have um, inspired us on many different levels. But you're also um, a voice, um, your voice into church and your voice into society um, on creative levels, on um, digital levels and on, on many leadership levels. And so uh, when I say thank you for joining us, uh, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. It means a lot that you just take this time to speak to our media collective community. Um, you share with me just the different um, videos and stuff that have been going online. And the one that really caught my eye recently was the BBC Radio one. And uh, there you were discussing the positives and the negatives of working from home. So we did a little poll on Instagram with our community. We said, who would like to continue working from home after COVID-19? Who thinks we should? 97% of the community said, yes, I think we should continue working at home. What do you think about that? What are the positives and the negatives of working from home? Well, it's not surprising really that people want to stay home and work in their pyjamas. I mean, that's a great option, isn't it? But I think uh, during this lockdown, a lot of people have tasted home working for the first time and they rather like it and they've decided I'd like to stay that way. Now, a lot depends on what the boss, if there is a boss, will allow at the end of the day. On the positive side, I think it's very good for the environment. Uh, you, you consider that three million people commute in and around London every single day. Um, the Square Mile, the city of London, sees its rather small population of 12,000 boosted to 400,000 every day because of wow. commuting. So you think about the damage that does to the environment. That's significant. Um, I think also there's a lot of productivity gains with working from home because we're spending less time getting to and from the workspace. On the minor side, I think the, the lack of social interaction can be a concern because Social connectivity face-to-face -face is very important to our mental health. It's also enormously important to productivity and particularly collaborative innovation. Now, I know we can do some of it this way, but when you FaceTime, Skype or Zoom somebody, you don't get to read the subtle biometric facial signals that uh, uncover someone's emotions. And, of course, sensing one another's emotions and showing empathy is an important part of relationship. But it's also an important part, as I say, of our mental health. So there's in the swings and roundabouts and people will have to make up their own minds. So if you were me, or let's just say you were Gary Clark and you had to make decisions moving forward uh, for our creative team, what would, you, what would you suggest? In terms of homeworking or just generally? Yeah, homeworking. Yeah, I think that it depends a lot on the individual. If you're going to make homeworking work, you have to be extremely self-disciplined and you have to have clear lines of accountability. So I would say I would never advocate it for any organization that wasn't sure that it had very, very clear lines of accountability. Um, so I think for some individuals it will work well. Others will say, no, hang on, I want to get in to where the action is. I want to come to the hub at least two or three days a week. I think for a little while, Dan, we're not going to have a lot of choice in the matter because in the post-lockdown pre-vaccine period, we sort of have a partial lockdown, which could last for six, nine, 12 months. Right. Um, there won't be a lot of choice because pre proximity rules or expectations will dictate how many people can be in an office space. So some will have to either stagger their working hours or work from home anyway. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. So, such a good insight. Um, what emerging communications technologies should um, creatives and comms people be watching for and engaging with um, in the next few years? Well, that's probably a four-hour question right there, but let me try to give, give you a couple because, you know, as a futurist, that's one of the things I'm looking at all the time. Right. Um, I think the, the way we use screens at the moment, say, for example, in church, is going to look rather tired in the next three to five years. Um, I think we need to start looking ahead now to, and I'll give you two texts in particular. One is holographic projection. Um, everybody knows what it is but it's not so consumer viable yet. I mean, French politicians have been using it to do town hall meetings in 11 venues at one time spread across the country. We all know that artists, alive and dead, <laughs> have appeared in front of live audiences using holographics. Um, at present, it's a bit clunky, it is expensive, it's a bit buggy, but it is moving ahead quickly and I think we need to watch for that. It's good for the environment, it will cut down on things like air travel, but again, it won't replace the face-to-face. The other one I think is worth watching right now 
is what we call haptic virtual reality technology. Right. Um, haptic simply means it fools our senses. So technologists have been able to work out ways to digitize things like sight, sound, and touch. And wow. we've been able to use yeah, the VR gloves and things for a while now, so we know what that is. But now they're finding ways to digitize smell and taste as well, which means that we could have a, a fully interactive, almost real 3D environment um, where even if we know it's false, it feels quite real. Uh, it's going to lead to what I call sociable media which is one step up from social media. Sociable media is where we'll have your avatar and my avatar, 3D rep representations of us in a virtual environment, having a cup of coffee together and feeling like we're actually sitting there drinking coffee. It's a way off, but we need to be looking for it now. We need to be planning towards it. That's crazy. I love that. Amazing. I feel like we could talk about that for hours, but um, yeah, we'll move on. Um, so we've got lots of young creatives um, as part of our whole um, media community. Uh, we call them sort of young creatives, but they're mostly like um, Gen Z. Uh, so for them, they're still at school and really thinking heavily about education uh, throughout this whole season. You know, what's going to happen? Will it affect my um, results, et cetera, et cetera. But what do you think education is going to look like moving forward out of COVID-19? Um, has it, will it change because of all this new digital um, interaction we're doing? It's a great question, Dan. And, and for those people who are in that situation, you know, that it's a big question and this is an important time in your life. So this is an important uh, question. I think that there are two aspects to this. Um, there's the logistics of education, how schools are actually run and how we get children and young people to school. And then there's the content. Uh, they're related, but they're, they're quite different aspects. And they, they come in in two phases. One is the partial lockdown phase that we're about to go into at some point soon, maybe three or four weeks away yet. And then there's the post-vaccine uh, area where we've got a, a, some sort of a vaccine for this. That might take 12 months or more. Let's cover the logistics quickly first. Logistics post-lockdown We'll have a lot of classes that are staggered where people are going into school earlier and coming home earlier than others. That'll be a pressure for some parents who have to find ways to have their, their young people looked after in the morning, you know, or, or in the afternoon. Um, we'll see a lot more, as you suggest, of augmented education where schools like universities are starting to realise that online and blended learning are actually really helpful, that they're not a threat to the classroom. Right. Um, we know even without COVID-19, then the average uh, in, in America, the college students of 2025, 75% of them will do their learning online completely. Right. The, the, even now, they only go in for the tutorials. They do the lectures on YouTube. Even the exams are sometimes done digitally now. So there's no reason why uh, we can't see more digitization of education. Now, in terms of the content, quickly, I think... One of the major developments on the back of COVID-19 will be the fact that we put more emphasis on mental health skills in our education. I don't just mean it, mental health in the school or in the university. I mean training children and young adults in things like um, anxiety management skills, problem-solving skills. Uh, we know that many adults during this season have found an increased problem with anxiety and depression levels. Uh, we don't yet know what effect it's having on suicide levels in Britain, but we know that connectedness is an important part of suicide prevention. And so children are affected by all that mental health issue, both directly and indirectly. So we need to teach from a young age, from primary school, things like anxiety management, strategic planning. Do you know that kids in Singapore now, as young as five, are being taught coding for computers? Wow. Not to produce more computer coders, but to help them learn logic and strategic thought. Uh, transition skills is a big one. You know, even without COVID-19, underemployment was going to be a problem in the next few years because of robotization of, of even the professions like medicine are affected. So people will need to transition not from one job to another, but one entire livelihood to another. Right. And there are certain skills, like those involved in cognitive behavioral therapy, that can be taught to young people and children that can help them deal with transition. I think that's, this is a huge area and we could talk about that one all night. Amazing. Um, Mal, while you're talking, I don't know if you can see the comments there, people are just writing all sorts of stuff. 
And um, I, I think for us as a media collective, you know, we've, we've had a lot of different people speaking about creativity. Uh, but to have someone, I guess, with your level of experience and your level of insight, uh, I think this is, this is pretty amazing for us. Thank you. Um, let, let's ask, I guess, the big question then. Um, so, you know, what do you think the role is for creatives uh, within the church and within society? All right. Well, let's broaden that out and use the word artist uh, for creative. So that we're talking about a certain type of creativity. Um, and I want to answer that in terms of the church, because that will apply then to society on a broader level. Um, in our time, I think the public life of church is dominated pretty much by uh, preachers and teachers. I mean, in the public sense. And I'm saying that as a preacher, so as a futurist and a minister. Um, but I think the relationship between artist and preacher-teacher uh, is an important one and will help us understand what artists are called to do. Um, and I'm going to illustrate it in a most unusual way, but you're all artists, so I can do that. I'm going to compare it with the relationship between modernism and postmodernism, which are two movements within the arts and architecture in the 20th century. Um, I was trained in architecture, so this is dear to my heart. Modernism arose in the earlier 20th century as a reaction to uh, Art Nouveau, all that nice flowery floral designs. And modernism said, look, style doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what the building or the piece of art or the, the tool does. So don't worry about what it looks like. Just build the thing to work. Um, Postmodernism came along about the 1960s as a reaction to that. Um, it's not an accident that rock music became popular at the same time because postmodernism said, hey, listen, uh, function isn't everything. Form is important too. It's not just important what something does. It's important what it looks like, what it feels like to use, the experience, the aesthetic. Um, and so in a way, the preacher-teacher role is a bit like the modernist thinking. It's functional. It's about content. It's about delivering the right content to, to get either someone to come to Christ or to equip them for their work of service. It's about content and function. I'm not saying it can't be done creatively. Like you, Dan, I try to do it as creatively as possible. But um, I'm saying that, generally speaking, it's about function, content. Now, the arts are, are like the postmodernism. The arts are about uh, form, style. Artists evoke emotion. They ask questions. Preachers tend to try to answer questions in polemic black and white terms. But artists just say, here, take a look at this. Take a listen to this. What does it make you feel? And what does that say to you? What does that say to your intellect? Um, and many young Christian artists today, I'm concerned for and pray for them because I think they're under pressure to be polemicists. That is to produce, so for example, paintings with every painting has to have a dove or a cross or, or, or a flame of fire, something that's recognizably, um, quote, Christian. But when we do that, we produce pretty boring, predictable, anemic works of art. The artist's role is not to preach. The artist's role is to produce reaction, to get people feeling and in a place where the polemic of the gospel can be preached. Wow. That's why music and preaching work so well, because music opens people up emotively to receive something that is for the intellect. But because they're open, it's so much easier. I'll finish the answer with this. A few years ago, we took, uh, for 10 years, we made a series of magazine documentaries called Edges, and they were seen around the world on Christian and secular stations without being edited in any way. And we took it to the BBC, and what they said was really interesting to me. Um, the head commissioner of this department said, first of all, he said, I can't believe Christians made this. Secondly, he said, you don't fit into any of the 60 commissioning departments we have at the BBC. You're not pure current affairs and you're not pure religion, are you? You're something in the middle. And I took that as a great compliment. And I think whatever we're creating artistically, whether it's music or a painting or a you know, sculpture or a piece of dance, we should aim for those two responses every time. I can't believe a Christian is doing this. Yeah. And, you know, you don't, it, it, there's a surprise about you. I can't put you in a box. I think that's art. And I think we've lost some of that. We used to lead the world in art. And we've lost some of that in the church because we think we all have to be preachers and polemicists. 
That's a long answer to a question. I'm sorry, but I couldn't do it short. Mal, Mal, that was insane. And I'm 100%, I totally agree with you. And, um, you know, coming out of this season, you know, you know, the big gatherings in the big arenas look like they're going to be, um, you know, maybe not very soon. So there'll be a lot of smaller local things. Uh, I think a lot of opportunity for creatives to step up and creatives to work with communicators. And just like you say, get that collaboration and that, that, that blend together. I think it's such an exciting time. Mal, thank you for everything that you just shared. Would you mind just praying for our community? Sure, absolutely. I'd be honoured. And thank you for having me today. I feel honoured to be involved in this thing. I love creatives. When I, I studied architecture, but even before that, I was a musician and I made three albums, solo albums, and one of them was on vinyl. And it was really cool to make a vinyl album back then. Um, so I've always had a thing about musicians and creatives generally, so it's a real honour, Dan. Let me pray.